Leonardo da Vinci captured the power and emotions of the Last Supper in his famous painting. The painting was not intended as a faithful reproduction of the original scene, although the setting and appearance of the table are from the 16th century, his painting still captures the moment. In a dark upper room in first century Palestine, Jesus has just told his disciples that one of them will betray him. When I sent you all to prepare for the Passover feast, I told you my time is near. I've looked forward to this hour with longing and anxiousness during this last Passover meal with you before my suffering began. For I tell you now that I will not eat it again until what it represents has occurred in the kingdom of God. But although we are together tonight, I had it, my heart is very sad because I know I tell you the truth, one of you is going to be. Nathaniel is my name, although I'm also called Bartholomew. I was born in Cana of Galilee, and like most of us, I was a fisherman. I'm close companions with Philip, and he was the one that first introduced me to Jesus. Philip said that Jesus of Nazareth was the one Moses and the prophets wrote about. I was skeptical, and I said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? because Nazareth is such a small, unimportant place. Before I even got to Jesus, he said, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. And I said, how do you know me? He answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. That was it. I knew he was the Messiah. Since then, I've served him walking through the villages of Galilee, watching him turn water into wine, going through the streets of the Decapolis, and now to the holy city, Jerusalem. And here at Passover, he tells us one of us is to betray him. He is the true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. He hasn't been wrong before. Who could it be? Could it be Nathaniel? Is it I? I was given the name Simon the Zealot. I was associated with the bloodthirsty, hot-headed rebels called the Zealots. We feared and hated the Romans and would settle for nothing less than the violent explosion of Rome from our beloved land. I lived by the sword, and if not for Jesus, I would have died by the sword. One day I heard him say, blessed are the peacekeepers, for those shall be called the name of God. And you shall love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. After hearing those words, I unconditionally surrendered to his will and followed him for wherever I, he led. You see, through Jesus, we will one day bring our blessed land back to the glory of God, the way he intended it to have. After watching Jesus conquer evil with, with unconditional love, I realized how powerful a sword of love can be. With love in my heart, I can overcome any adversity that I have to face. And now he says, there's a spiritual roaming among us, one who might attempt to force 
what only can be conquered by love. Who could it be? Matthew, the publican? Or is it Peter, the big fisherman? Or is he talking about me? Because I was a former zealot. Is it I? Is it me? My name is James, but since I'm smaller than most of my companions, I'm called James the Lesser. Thaddeus and I are brothers, and together we first saw the master on the day John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus. I was curious to see what was happening, so I turned aside for a closer look. I saw Jesus asking John to baptize, baptize him in a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Later, Jesus called me to be one of his disciples, and I followed him without hesitation at all. And now, one of us is to betray him? Surely this is madness to think one of us could do this. And yet I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I? My real name is Judas Labaeus. But to lessen the confusion between I and Judas Iscariot, I'm called Thaddeus. I will remember the day that Jesus called me. After a night of prayer, he commissioned us to go forth and preach that the kingdom of hand, the kingdom of God, is at hand. He told us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, since he was sending us forth as sheep among wolves. Just a few days ago, Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and I was sure his hour had come, <coughs> that he would ascend to the throne of David. But he's just spoken some troublesome words. I suddenly see him astride his donkey, in, We've had this Passover feast in such secrecy that we were told to look for a man carrying a pitcher to know the place. I'm afraid for our safety. And now he said that someone is to betray him. Is there a wolf among us? Who can it be? Is it me? I am, I am Andrew the brother of Simon Peter. I am not a gifted man, just a simple fisherman. I do what I could to serve the Lord. I brought my brother Simon Peter and have watched with great satisfaction in the changes in his life. I also found the little lad with the five loaves of bread and the two fish the day that Jesus fed the 5,000. Such miracles. The Lord graciously loves everybody. I have been very close with the master, certainly not one of the inner circle, but I do not wish to be. I only wish to bring others closer to Jesus so that they can see the true Lamb of God. What greater life can, what greater gift can life fulfill with a simple fisherman than to be a partner and a friend of Jesus? And now he says one of his friends is to betray him. Who could it be? Could it be I, Andrew the bringer, that be the one to bring down our Lord? Is it me? Is it I? My surname is Levi, but you know me as Matthew, the tax collector. Because of my profession, I've never known true friendship or love. But all that changed one day as I looked down at my collecting table and I saw a shadow come across it. I looked up and I saw the eyes of a man. That man is the prophet, Jesus. In those eyes I saw compassion that 
I've never seen before in any other man, and trust me, I have seen the eyes of many men as they have come across to pay their dues to the government. Follow me is all that Jesus said. And so I got up, I left behind my life as a tax collector, and I followed him. And it was the best decision that I've ever made in my life. Since then, I've tried to understand how everything that he has done has been done to fulfill the words of the prophets who spoke about the coming Messiah. I have tried to write down the exact words that the priest has spoken. I've traded in the wretchedness of my sin for the dignity of his discipleship. I no longer have to collect taxes or make change. Instead, with his help, I change sinners into saints. Jesus, my King, has shown me the way, the truth, and the life. And even now, as I write down this good news about his coming, he tells us bad news. He says that one of us, his most trusted followers, is to betray him. Does, does my Lord suspect me because I was once a tax collector? Is it I? Is it I? I am Judas Iscariot, certainly the most trusted member of Master's beloved society. I suppose it was my past experiences with the revolutionaries who plotted to overthrow the government that led Jesus to choose me to follow him. I have known Jesus was the Messiah for a long time now, but I'm just not so sure anymore. He doesn't seem ready to overthrow the Roman government. He talks about sin and repentance and loving the less fortunate. I am the trusted treasurer of this group. I pay for provisions along the, along the way in Jesus' ministry. I even give some of our treasures to the poor because only one day we will need them. I will admit greed is a struggle for me, but I don't want to talk about it. I just want tonight to be over. Jesus talks about one of us betraying him. Even if I was, I'm not sure any of the other disciples would have known I sold Jesus out. I'll go along with the rest of them. Act surprised. I might even ask, is it I? Is it I? My name is Philip, and I come from Bethsaida in Galilee. Jesus called me one day when I was following and listening to the preachings of John the Baptist. I was the fourth disciple chosen, and I brought Nathaniel to the Master. During these years of close fellowship with Jesus, my faith in God has grown. When he fed the 5,000, I was the one that asked, where are we to buy food that all these may eat? It was only after that that I discovered that through Jesus, through his vision and power, we are able to work into the world with his love and compassion. <clears throat> because I know the Greek language, I am also called the Greek, and I was able to have the Greeks even speak with our master. Through these encounters, I have grown to understand the master's words. In fact, I am convinced that he who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. And now, having seen the Father through him, he shocks us by saying that there's a betrayer in our midst. Does the traitor not know that in betraying Jesus, he is also betraying God? Who can it be? Is it Philip? Is it I? I'm Simon Peter. My brother Andrew and I were out fishing one day when Jesus walked by and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
We immediately left our nets and went out to follow him. He even gave me my name, Peter, which means the rock. And when I confessed him as the Christ, the son of the living God, he said, on this rock, I will build my church. It's strange that he would choose a hot-headed fisherman with a runaway tongue like me, but I think it is my faith. He told us that faith in trials proves more genuine and more worthy than gold. And when I saw him out walking on the water, I'm the one who leapt from the boat to try and go out to him. It is true that I lost confidence and began to sink, but my faith in him is unshakable. Until now. Tonight, when I promised to follow him anywhere, he told me that before the rooster crows twice, I'll deny him three times. He said he prayed for me because Satan wanted to sift me like sand. Will I deny him tonight before the rooster crows? Will he deny me and close the doors of the kingdom to me? Am I this betrayer he speaks of? If I knew who this scoundrel was, I'd pierce his heart with this sword to prove my love for him. But what if it were my own heart that I pierced? Am I the one? Is it I? Is it I? I have been given the nickname Doubting Thomas by those who know me. Since the days I was a fisherman with Simon and Andrew, I have been cautious, careful, and certain of my actions. I usually demand proof before I believe. I want to see before committing myself. You see, I'm not a man of doubt. Rather, I'm a man of daring. When Mary and Martha sent word to the Lord that their brother Lazarus was dead, Jesus said, let us go to him. Some of the apostles were afraid due to the growing opposition of Jesus. I was the one who spoke out. I was the one who rebuked them, saying, let us also go with him so that we may die with him. Why is it that people forget my, over, overlook my daring and remember my doubting? Remember my questioning, but overlook my affirmations. Jesus' enemies are determined to destroy him. Why? Because the God he reveals is a greater God than the petty little man-made deities they have enshrined upon the altar of their hearts. Jesus would bring us all up to God while his enemies would cut down God to their own sons. And now Jesus has brought back doubt into my heart when he says that one of us is to betray him. Is he blaming my lack of faith? My lack of courage? Is it I? Is it I? I remember the first time Jesus called to me, John. My brother James and I were mending our nets on our father's boat when he, Jesus told us to follow him. We were so excited, we dropped everything and followed him. Since that time, I have tried to figure out I've tried to understand Jesus through his love. And being that I am such an impetuous, fiery spirit, it is hard to do. But the love of the master has changed me. And now I am called the beloved disciple. Jesus once said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Now that is true sacrificial love. He has given so much for us. And like the good shepherd... He protects us and he loves us. Someday, I want to share with the whole world about the good, our Good Shepherd so that they will believe that he is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, that they may find eternal life. For he said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And now, he just told us that one of us will betray him. Can a sheep betray a shepherd? Is there a wolf among our fold? Certainly it cannot be my brother, or Peter, or Andrew. Could it be John, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Is it I? I am James, the brother of John. We've often been referred to as the sons of thunder. We were fishermen with our father Zebedee, when we were, and we were honored when Jesus wanted us as his disciples. 
I was present in Peter's home when he healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Later, I watched as he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. But the most, most astonishing event occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration when we saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. Our mother urged us to petition Jesus to allow us to sit on either side of him in his kingdom. He replied, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup with which I am to drink or be baptized with the baptism which is intended for me? He reminded us that he who, who would be first must be servant of all. And he demonstrated his words by washing our feet. I've always tried to represent the highest power and the strongest Christian quality, love. And now, he who taught us the way of love is to be betrayed by one of those that he loved. Who could it be? Why would one of us do such a thing? Is it I? Is it I? Ask Jesus who it is. Who is going to betray him? Master, my heart is sick. I must know, who is it? Who is going to betray you? One who dips his bread with me in my bowl. Pray me. The Son of Man will go to the cross as it was planned. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for you to have never been born. You have all stayed with me through my trials. Just as my Father has given me the right to rule, so I will make the same agreement with you all. So I will make you the same agreement. You will eat and drink at my table in the kingdom. You will sit on thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. I wanted so much to eat this last Passover meal with you before the suffering begins, before my suffering begins. For I tell you, I will never eat it until it is given its full, full meaning in the kingdom of God. We have so many memories to share tonight. Now, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this when you... Eat and remember of me. Take and drink. This is my blood given for you remissions of your sins, and it seals God's covenant, this blood will be poured out for the many for the remissions of their sins as well. I tell you, I will not drink the wine until the day I drink the new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. Drink again, all of you. All of you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now that you have known me, you will know my Father also. If you abide in me, and, you, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done. But my Father's, my, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As my Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your, your joy may be full. This is my commandment to you. Love one another, and for greater than Greater love has none than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master does. So now I call you my friends, 
All things I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So as you go into the world as sheep among wolves, remember my new commandment, love one another. For if you have love for one another, then all will know that you are my disciples. When I was a little boy up in Dallas, Texas, uh, we had vacation Bible school every summer. My parents made sure we were all there. My pastor used to make us sing the same five or six songs all week long, every year. And I used to think, as I got a little bit older, man, this is boring. But as I now stand here at 61, it's not boring at all to remember those beautiful, simple, Jesus loves you kind of songs. And one of my very favorites was, God loves me dearly. Do you know that one? It's about like Jesus loves me. The first verse goes like this. God loves me dear. If you know it, you can sing along. God loves me dearly, loves me salvation. God loves me dearly, loves even me. Therefore, I'll say again, God loves me dearly. God loves me dearly, loves even me. Isn't that beautiful? I think of that song when I watch these guys, each one stand up and do a part, and each one correctly portrayed how much that disciple realized that God loved him individually. And you know, you don't get it man for man There's in the, in the four Gospels, but you get about eight or nine of them where they get a chance to express their faith or like Thomas expressing doubt and fill up his bewilderment because he doesn't understand how to say he's seen the Father if he's seen Jesus. But in their lifetime, you know they had come to that. And John displayed it in his gospel really well when he said, uh, I am the one that he loved, and I have seen these things, and I am bearing witness to all the things that he did, so you may have the same eternal life that we have. Oh, God loves us dearly. When you listen to these guys, couldn't you find yourself in one or more of their stories? That's what it's about. Oh. The Lord's Supper is about that too. When we stand up here and we preach and we give you a blanket gospel, or I, like at the beginning of church when I said you were forgiven to all, that's corporate, that's as a group, right? And when we sit maybe in a study or your home and, or on a park bench and we give you, and Christians give each other individual love and forgiveness, that's individual, right? But Jesus himself said when the church comes together, there's something throughout it perpetuity that I want you to do that will be me loving that person one-on-one -on -one every time you do it. And it was this Lord's Supper. And so it was that night when he said, one of you will betray them, and every one of them had to think it through. Is it? He didn't say who it was, right? Fascinating brilliance of a shepherd of souls. That he, would, he knew it was Judas, but he would make every one of them wonder if it was them for a while. So they would think about, they were capable of betraying him. And you can see how easy it is for us to fool ourselves and lie to ourselves when you listen to Peter. And Peter did Peter very well. So cocksured that night, I will never deny you. And Jesus, since Peter wasn't getting it, this little exercise on asking if it's you, he just says, Peter, you're, you're going to deny me. He says it in front of them all. Because we must go down to the bottom of understanding how much we need a Savior to appreciate that our Savior loves us one-on-one, -on -one, knowing absolutely every evil we are capable of and that we're going to commit in our lifetime, even if we don't know it. And it's so wonderful when a, when a sinner finds out Jesus got over your sin that you feel shame about or guilt about 2,000 years ago at the cross. And that he's already taken care of it. And the Lord's Supper is already there because you're going to continue to sin even after you come to faith. There's, I'm, I'm going to be careful not to go into too much detail, but I want to share with you something about the beauty of the Lord's Supper in a Jewish context. The Lord's Supper replaces all the Old Testament sacrifices. It's not a sacrifice. 
It is the body and blood of the once for all sacrifice Savior given in a sacred act, which was the word for sacred act is sacra meant. And what Jesus was doing that night was replacing the Passover that had a sacrificial lamb and all the Jewish sacrifices that, got, that were given to the Israelites after the Passover at Mount Sinai. And Jesus is the once for all sacrifice. says so in Hebrews 9, 10, uh, in the New Testament where the writer's writing to the Jewish Christians reminding them that, that, that Jesus is the once-for-all sacrifice. But the once-for-all sacrifice is distributed every time we take the Lord's Supper as God's accepted payment for your sin. And you need it personally, individually, often, because you sin often. Brilliant! The world cannot captivate this in its psychology and trying to heal the human heart of guilt and shame, it cannot replace what Jesus has done. What he did for all people on the cross, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, he gives to you individually in his supper. So you can't be very far from God as long as you stay near his church that's giving out the Lord's Supper because you're brought back to the sacrifice for your sins that you committed yesterday, 10 minutes ago, a second ago, and that really big one you still keep thinking about from when you were 18 or 17. You are forgiven. Here is my sacrifice. It's big enough. God loves you dearly, grants you salvation. God loves you dearly, loves even you. See? That's what the Lord's Supper is. And as you take it tonight, you think about these guys going, is it me? And then they know Jesus' love and they got the Lord's Supper anyway. He would have given it to Judas had he stayed, right? Wouldn't have saved him because Judas had no faith, right? This Judas does. That's why we let him come back up here. <laughs> he's going to get the Lord's Supper in a minute because he's really not Judas. He's Miles. But man, did he do a good Judas. Huh? Hard to play the bad guy. Now, one last thing and then we're ready to have the Lord's Supper. This beautiful, wonderful thing that we receive as a forgiveness of our sins takes care of our current guilt and shame, also takes care of the current guilt and blame of the people you're mad at. And if they're in your home, or your Christian family, or your church, and they're up here taking the Lord's Supper with you, you've got a, a, a double whammy. They're, it's the it's that they get the same grace and forgiveness that you get. So here's the question. Are you coming believing that the grace of the replacement of all the Jewish sacrifices, which were intended to help bring unity among Israelites who were mad at each other, the Old Testament sacrifice, the replacement is Jesus. Are you ready to let that be the reason you forgive every? And you stop living in anger. I know you're ready. So let's come to the sacrament as a living Lord's Supper for us. Singing in our heart. God loves me dearly. Amen.